If you ache for truth, goodness, and beauty, if you're hungry for a Christianity with substance and strength, if you long for a faith that's big and bold and biblical and all about Jesus Christ, if you're inspired by the idea of one church that has spanned 20 centuries, 24 time zones, and two hemispheres, enfolding every race, nation, and language, then you're considering Catholicism. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Greg. I'm your host, and I am here again. I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> we haven't left the room. We haven't left the room. I'm still here with Corey Licados, and we had just finished a conversation, which was the previous episode, about corruption in the Catholic Church. We were talking because one of the common things that we hear from your emails and stories is sometimes the resistance that some of you get from friends, family, colleagues for showing interest in the Catholic Church. And sometimes your friends and family and colleagues will say some really nasty things about the Catholic Church and nasty things about Catholicism. And one email in particular had prompted the conversations that Corey and I are having today because there was a, a young woman who has a listener and has been investigating Catholicism, walking down the road to Rome, who finally told her father that she was you know, thinking about becoming Catholic, and he kind of went on and on about, how could you join the Catholic Church? It's so corrupt, and got into all the kinds of stories of corruption and blah, 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 blah. And so we thought, what should she say? How, did she, how should she respond to her father? So we just talked in the last episode about what we called garden variety corruption, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean it's not bad. It is just bad. means it's the kind of things that are common to mankind. People steal money and all, all people are subject to financial corruption, sexual These corrupt, are common temptations, common sins, common failings of mankind in every race, nation, religion, institution. And it's really no surprise that they're going to find their way into the Catholic Church as well. But now we want to turn our attention to what we're calling more exotic yes. <laughs> forms of corruption or more exotic charges mm -hmm. of corruption or charges of more exotic corruption yes, is yes. Right, the right way to put it, right? Which Corey's going to do some unpacking of this. But to, just to frame it, which really amounts to slander against the church, where there is a lot of propaganda and slanderous accusations about Catholicism and the Roman Catholic Church. Corey, you're going to tee it up. You're a historian. Walk us through the history of slander and propaganda, exotic slander yes, yes, and the propaganda weird stuff. <laughs> yeah, uh, against the Catholic Church. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you're right in saying that it's a matter of slander, and slander can be based on a few different things. I mean, you can just totally make stuff up. It can be completely fictional. It can be based on misunderstanding of something that's then taken maliciously and run with. Or it can be based on misunderstanding of something that's true that's then run with maliciously. Or it can be sort of take a kernel of truth or a grain of truth and twist it and misrepresent it and use it in a way that is not honest and that slanders the church. And so you see these different kinds throughout history. But the church has dealt with slander from the beginning. I mean, from the early days in which the apostles who were Jews and then their opponents, especially like in the temple hierarchy and the scribes and Pharisees, so a different party or a different group of Jews were at odds with each other. And you had the Jewish leaders either misunderstanding or misrepresenting what the Christians believed, especially to the Romans in order to get the Romans to prosecute them. You see this in the trial, well, of Christ himself, who was slandered in various ways. People misrepresented things that he said in order to try and get him in trouble. And then you see that in the trial of Paul and other of the apostles, that people are saying things that are untrue. Like the charge that they stole the body. Right. They stole the body. Or when uh, they... Uh, misrepresented what Christ said about uh, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. They deliberately misquoted him and 
messed with his meaning there. So you have that from the very beginning. And then you have Christianity going out into wider Roman society throughout the empire, and there being misunderstandings and slander. Anti-Christian uh, polemicists in, in Rome claimed that Christians were cannibals. They either misunderstood or deliberately misrepresented the Eucharist, the eating of Christ's flesh and blood. They claimed that they ate children, that they committed incest, which seems to have been based on the fact that Christians called each other brothers and brother and sister. And of course, some of them were married to each other. And so all of this was used in a propaganda campaign against them that they undermined the empire that because they wouldn't sacrifice to the gods. Go ahead. I hate to interrupt, but that they were atheists. Yes. That so one. one of the big charges that the Romans had against the Christians, as you say, the slander, the propaganda mm -hmm. uh, and that led to the, ju that justified the persecutions a lot of times yeah. was, as you said, they practice in secret, they practice cannibalism because they meet to eat flesh and drink blood. And as you said, they, brothers and sisters marry each other. And, but another one charges that they were atheists. Because they refused to worship and recognize the gods of Rome and the emperor chief among them. And obviously Christians aren't atheists. They recognize one God, but that was also misrepresented. They said, oh, your, your God is a Jewish carpenter who died on a, on a cross as, as a criminal. That's not a God. If you think he's a God, then clearly you, don't, you either don't know what a God is or you don't believe in any. And so this was used against the Christians and used to persecute them. And so obviously, as the Roman Empire is converted and as you get into an age where Christians in Europe were not subject to outside slander nearly as much because it was a predominantly Christian society. It's not that slander as a sin disappears, but, but this kind of thing is not as big of a deal. Where it becomes a big deal again is when you get into the Protestant Reformation and then after that into the, the Enlightenment and in modernity. And so you have strong factions in, in Western society and then in global society that are against Christianity and then against the Catholic Church in particular. And so you have Lutherans, Reformed, any, any number of Protestant groups that have a vested interest in slandering the Catholic Church. And then further on from that in history, you start to have atheists or revolutionary governments or any number of organizations that also have an interest in this. And so the, the first one in that series is, is Protestants of various kinds. And not to say that there aren't others or that those are historically insignificant, but kind of the, the big one is the English crown, the English government after Henry VIII and then to Elizabeth and, and others in power in, in England and in the British Isles, because the, the schism with the Church of England created a national church. And so adherence to loyalty to the national church was seen as fundamental and essential to loyalty to the state and being a good citizen. And so if you are a Catholic, you are a bad Englishman. And therefore, the government of England ran a very purposeful propaganda campaign against the church. It's also tied up into European politics because the Spanish were a Catholic power that was at odds with the English. And so you're seen as being disloyal and maybe aiding and abetting the enemies of the crown if you're Catholic. And so that's kind of the seedbed where these misrepresentations or slanders come from. So when that English propaganda machine is really in high gear, mm -hmm. is, as you say, during the reign of Elizabeth I, which was coincidentally when Shakespeare was writing his sure, plays, yeah. right? So we can all acknowledge that the English were incredibly creative storytellers. They were really good at storytelling. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, look at Shakespeare. And so their propagandists in the English government, which was coextensive with the English church, because mm -hmm. it was a state church, as you said, they really went to high gear producing misinformation, disinformation, really exotic propaganda about the Catholic church, about the Pope, about priests, about Jesuits, about everything. Mm -hmm. And that propaganda machine cranked for 150, 200 years and was really creative. So I know you, you've you actually spent a fair amount of time in England, Corey, and a little bit, yeah. and, you're a, and you're a devotee of that period. So why don't you tell us about some of the more exotic slanders 
uh, about the Catholic Church that the English government used to put out there. Yeah, so you mentioned the Jesuits. So to, to set the context, once the Catholic faith was outlawed and under legal sanction in England, it wasn't safe or legal to be a Catholic priest, to be celebrating the Mass, to be going about your priestly duties. So the priests had to go underground, and a large number of them were Jesuits. They, As an order, they accepted this very difficult and dangerous task of essentially infiltrating England to care for the Catholic families that were still there to preach the faith in an underground kind of way. And so you had all kinds of stories about them plotting to kill the, kill the queen or to undermine the government or to stage rebellion against the crown and the government of England. So the thing to understand is that in this, especially under Elizabeth I, you had very intense persecution. I mean, priests especially were being drawn and quartered, which is a nasty and painful and ugly way to die. And so Catholics, they had some legitimate grievances, you might say. And so there was certainly discontent and there were some plots or efforts to undermine the government. They didn't really amount to much. And most of the Catholics in the country weren't in on them, especially the ordinary people. But You know, again, just take that little kernel of truth and blow it out of proportion. And that's how you get a a propaganda campaign. And so Catholic priests and Catholics in general were endlessly portrayed as seditionists, as assassins, as people who are going to destabilize the church and destabilize the government and society in general. The famous one is the gunpowder plot on the 5th of November. Golly, that's embarrassing. I forget the year. But that was blown way out of proportion and used to persecute and to martyr many Catholics. So for some people, the gunpowder plot was Guy Fawkes Day. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, was- that, and that, that is a beautiful example of how this works at the popular level, because Guy Fawkes Day to this day is a popular holiday in England. A lot of the anti-Catholicism of it has faded away as England has become more secular. But in its heyday, I mean, it was all about burning in effigy, Guy Fox, who stood, he, who was a, a symbol of the Catholic plot to bring down the nation. And you did that in a giant bonfire on November 5th every year. This is how, this is how the church instills values and loyalty is you make a feast day and people celebrate it. It's also how the Protestant government of England did it by encouraging these kinds of popular expressions of anti-Catholicism. And by going upstream from that, right? So the English government starts manufacturing all these stories about what the papacy is doing sure. and how the Pope is basically like this diabolical, like a James Bond villain. Right, an international puppet master. Yeah, he's like a James Bond villain hiding in thing with his master plan to do things. And they're also doing weird stuff in the Vatican. They're doing magic and pagan worship and behind the scenes, all this stuff. And when these priests are gathering at mass, they're doing pagan-y things. And of course, there were accusations of plenty of sexual shenanigans, as you would expect. The most kind of famous one or the famous genre of accusation, you might say, would be about monks and nuns either being... Well, the uh, tunnel stories. Yeah, the, the, tunnel, the tunnel stories story. are one Talk part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> monks, so stories and, and scandal about monks and nuns being sexually deviant, one type of story was that there would be the convent of nuns over here and across the street or across town, the monastery of monks over here. And then there'd be a secret tunnel that they had dug, excavated between it so that they could go back and forth, or I don't know, meet in the middle and have these illicit sexual liaisons. Then these stories were just totally made up. I mean, it's demonstrably false. These things didn't exist. That whole tunnel thing too kind of expands because it turns out like in the English propaganda, there's all kinds of tunnels, tunnels (laughs) by which the conspirators are going to blow up the houses of parliament, tunnels by which the monks and nuns are doing this, tunnels where the secret gold is hidden, Mm -hmm. tunnels down to the caverns where priests and stuff are doing weird pagan worship to destabilize and destroy the good Christian nation. All this kind of stuff just gets really crazy, and it creates a a genre, if that's the right word, or a a precedent, or a tradition Mm -hmm. is the word I guess I'm looking for, a tradition of this kind of slanderous, exotic stories where the Catholic Church is like this 
weird James Bond. What's the organization in the James Bond movie? Spectre? Oh, okay. I'm ignorant of James Bond. Okay, but- Spectre or something, right? It's like this international secretive organization mm-hmm. that's trying to destabilize and destroy the world. And right? and you get these genres. And some of that gets played up with some of the monastic orders coming out of the Crusades that we've talked about, the mm-hmm. warrior monks. So the Knights Templar. Now, it's true there were some financial scandals with the Knights Templar, ordinary financial scandals. But like the Knights Templar get played up as this kind of crazy, magical, demonic, conspiratorial organization that's running the world. Yeah, and so some of this is then launching or lobbying historical charges that might not have been. The Knights Templar didn't still exist at that time, but just to to discredit the Catholic Church. The, the other big one is what's called the Black Legend, which was about the Spanish Inquisition. No one was expecting that to come up. There's wild exaggeration having you know, sprouting from things like the English government or other governments in Europe that were politically on the opposite side from the Spanish to say, oh, these horrible things that happened, or of course, on the opposite side of the Catholic Church and the Vatican. Oh, the, so many people were killed and burned and whatnot in, in ways that if you actually, and people have done this, you actually look at the historical record, you see that they're, they're, amazing exaggerations. They, they just don't bear any resemblance to the actual facts anymore. What's interesting, if you go down the dark tunnel of the internet, this is speaking of tunnels, mm-hmm. the dark tunnel of the internet, you'll find all these things and always have been for hundreds and hundreds of years about all these exotic tortures that the Catholic Church did and mm-hmm. all these exotic iron maidens and the things, the cages they put people right. in and all this terrible stuff and all these weird exotic kind of semi-magical, semi-pagan torture chambers and dungeons. One of the things that's interesting about that, a lot of that stuff actually comes from uh, the Enlightenment or the Reformation. A lot of those things, if you look at the dating of them, they're not the Middle Ages. It's not medieval Catholicism. It dates from either the Renaissance or post-Renaissance, like the Enlightenment period. And a lot of them are actually practiced by Protestant Protestants in Germany and other these other places. So yeah, but a lot of it becomes this fictionally, imaginatively, the Catholic Church is the secret organization behind history that's doing all these weird things. And you know that back in the Vatican, they must be doing satanic rituals. And mm-hmm. so carry that forward because this whole notion too. Let's get into that. that the Catholic Church, with all of its candles and chanting and robes and all of this business behind the scenes, it's some kind of weird satanic thing. It's all wrapped up in this propaganda that the Reformation was creating these pure biblical churches mm-hmm. with this kind of pure Christianity without all the mumbo jumbo and magicalism of Catholicism. And then all that gets just laid. Oh, and plus that the Catholic Church was keeping the Bible from people sure, sure. so that they could keep them repressed and everything. Carry that forward. So from the English Reformation and some of the Protestant mm-hmm. Reformation stuff, you would get into the French Revolution and yeah. Enlightenment and then and in, into early uh, United States American history. Yeah, and, and I think there is, there's a thread to follow there. And so those early... Not the very earliest, but the, the those Reformation era slanders that we're talking about are generally the gist of those is generally the Catholic Church is not true Christianity and therefore it's undermining true Christianity, it's undermining true Christian governments like the government of England that claim to be pure and, and true Christian governments and Christian churches. When you get into the Enlightenment, the reason for the slander shifts because then you have secular or even atheistic motivation for slandering the church. So now when you get into the, especially like the French revolution or later like Marxism, the thrust there is that the Catholic church is a super, some, it's some of the same kinds of accusations, but with a different spin. The Catholic church is superstitious and magical in its thinking and is trying to keep people down, is trying to keep them subject to the kings and aristocracies that we're trying to get rid of in the course of these revolutions that all of the bishops and priests are corrupt and self-serving and they're just taking the people's money and keeping the common man down and of course there were problems in the in the church as there always are and there were some bishops and priests who were corrupt but again it's either exaggeration or misrepresentation or taking it and making it a an operative narrative for propaganda to say see the church has been keeping you down for millennia 
and therefore must be done away with. Um, that, that was the line taken by the French revolutionary governments and then revolutionaries on from that. There is that French revolution thing. Mm-hmm. We all love the musical Les Mis, right? Mm-hmm. And the big song in there, the red and the black, mm-hmm. right? You know, the whole context oh, yeah, of that, yeah, yeah. right? The red and the black is this thing that comes out of the revolution, French revolution. And it's stirring when you listen to the music of Les Mis mm-hmm. and they're waving the big, and the red, the song thing of angry men, black is, but what that refers to actually is this anti-Catholic slander. It's anti-clericalism. Because the black, because the clerics, as you say, the priests wore black and the clerics wore black. And so black represented repression. And represented the, past, the so-called dark ages. The dark ages, right? And red represents revolution, right? right. Proto-communist revolution. The light about to dawn, as the yeah, song Yeah, the light says. about to dawn and all this kind of stuff. And so all of everything that, is essentially everything that was wrong with the world mm-hmm. Pick anything in the world that's bad or wrong or unpleasant, it's because of the black. That's mm-hmm. the church that has screwed the world up for, at that point, 1,700 years. And we still get to that today, which is that the church becomes blamed for every wrong, every ill, mm-hmm. everything that's ever happened, and no matter how exotic, how crazy. Yeah. Yeah, th- th- that's absolutely right. And the in- not to go off on a tangent about musical theater, but the thing about Les Mis is that you see the revolutionaries, but I don't think the musical at all vindicates them. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, that's a whole nother time. We'll <laughs> yeah, that's that another time. Actually, I think that... We, we could do an episode on Les Mis. We should, yeah. because I think that the musical Les Mis is one of the most Catholic, oh, yeah. pro-Catholic, truly Catholic stories you've absolutely. ever had. And then, of course, it's based on the book by Victor Hugo, which mm-hmm. is a pro-Catholic novel yeah but what do you go right yeah it is victor hugo so yeah we should talk about that at a separate time because that would be a good talk we should do like a book club yeah i have except except i tried actually reading les mis once and it's yeah i I keep meaning to get the audiobook but it's 35 hours long it's yeah it's like 47 (laughs) hour audiobook i actually downloaded off audible one time i had all these car trips and i'm like i'm just gonna listen to it and it's like super crazy it's long. a 19th century novel that's what but it's are. like but, yeah. of 19th century it's the er <laughs> 19th century like war and peace is a short story compared to les mis <laughs> so the musical is actually sort of a nice quick quicky way to do it but yeah it, it we should do a book club on. yeah but let's we'll get back to yes to, to, to anti-catholic center we got the romans slandering mm-hmm. and then we've got the protestants slandering the english government we've got the french revolutionaries and then we get to early america yeah so America is interesting because anti-Catholicism in America is basically a hybrid of that Protestant slander of the church and the Enlightenment slander of the church because America is founded, I mean, it's a, it's a predominantly Protestant country. Most of the people in early America were Protestant of one sort or another. Uh, and the majority of them, of course, there were Catholics, there were Jews, there were others, but the vast majority of them culturally it was dominated by the Church of England and then the Episcopal Church that came out of that after independence. And so it inherited the anti-Catholic slander of England and of the Reformation, which made the essential argument that Catholics are bad Christians and that the Catholic Church with its sinister pope is trying to undermine true Christianity. And so that kind of slander is very active in America. But America is also a country that's largely based on Enlightenment political ideas, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, all of that. And even though our revolution wasn't as crazy as the French Revolution, it was still part of that revolutionary Enlightenment um, ferment of the uh, 18th and then into the 19th centuries. And so you also have that kind of slander of saying that the Catholic Church has held people back from enlightenment and learning and true liberty. And of course, Americans didn't like kings and aristocracy, and the Catholic Church was seen as allied with that because it had been historically. And, and so all of that was used as fodder for slander. So, so what you get in America after the founding and then really ramps up in the, the press of the, the 1800s is the the basic charge is that a Catholic can't be a good citizen because he's subject to a foreign power, a foreign potentate, a foreign king, this, this Pope in Rome, and that you get all of these articles and ca- the cartoons are very instructive. 
these political cartoons of how the Pope is, he's plotting the downfall of the American government. He has, his Catholics are basically like spies. They're plants in America trying to bring the place down. They don't really believe in freedom and liberty and they can't really be good Americans. And he's sending hordes of immigrants to America in order to inundate us. And you get these crazy claims like the Pope wants to take over America so he can move the Vatican there and, and rule the world from the United States. It's some spicy stuff. Yeah. A few years ago, I taught a class at Lane. Like we've talked about that. You talked about Mm -hmm. that in the previous episode, Lakeshore Academy for the New Evangelization. I taught a class about history of Catholicism in America. Mm -hmm. And we did a whole night session where we looked at these cartoons, these political cartoons from the 19th century, Mm -hmm. uh, by, especially by this guy named Thomas Nash. Yeah. And it's crazy. You either, you, one you have, one of his frequent themes was that he portrays the Pope and, and bishops and priests as crocodiles. Yeah, because the mitre, he makes the mitre look like a yeah, crocodile snout. Yeah, it looks snout. like a crocodile yeah. snout, yeah. And so there's all these crocodiles, and the crocodiles are coming on the shore of America. So he's got, here's the shore of America, and there's like nice young children walking along the shore and the crocodiles, the bishop crocodiles are coming up and snatching and eating the children. They're all like, ah, mm-hmm. their parents are trying to, and meanwhile, there's like the king crocodile across the mm-hmm. water in Rome who's sending his other crocodile, bishop crocodiles over here to take your children and steal them away. Mm-hmm. And this is crazy, kind of like you talk about propaganda stuff. There's other ones where they portray the Pope as an octopus. Yes, yes. Yeah, he's got this giant octopus, these tentacles that are going to come through the American government and institutions and corrupt America and send all the Italians and the whatever over here. I mean, all these immigrants. Yeah, yeah, and the Irish. And, Irish yeah. and whatever. And the crocodile is going to get his tentacles into every aspect of American life and corrupt it. There's one where, uh, and this is interesting because uh, uh, one of the frequent claims was they were going to destroy American schools, yes. American public education. Yes. Because if you let these kids into your public schools, they would come in and undermine and destroy American ideals. Yeah. And, and so there's this one where, Thomas Nash cartoon, where there's these wolves. It's got a picture of a schoolroom and the children are all in here cowering the schoolroom and the brave teacher is in the schoolroom and these wolves are like trying to get in the door and their snouts are in snapping and he's trying to close the door against the wolves and the wolves are the, the Catholics and the Catholic church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I did not to interrupt, but yeah, it's yeah. just, it's just crazy stuff about how it was going to destroy everything about America and American institutions because these Catholics would be loyal, as you say, to a foreign power. And, and then the first Catholic candidate for the, uh, president of the United States, uh, yeah. Al Smith. Yeah, from New York. Yeah, and he was charged as if he would be basically a foreign agent. Mm-hmm. So if you were elected president, what you would really have is the Pope running America because Al, the Catholic president would just listen to whatever the Pope said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and this kind of anti-Catholicism in America was never really entirely gone away, but was very strong in public life, at least up until the 60s. And of course, you famously have John F. Kennedy, who is the first Catholic who is elected to the presidency. And he did it basically by downplaying all of that and denying all of that and saying, that's all not true. I'm not just going to take marching orders from the Pope and all of that. So you have the slander of the church going well into the 20th century along those lines in America. But then I I think some of the slanders that people are most familiar with are more recent. The last half of the 1900s and then into this century, you get things that are produced out of Protestant fundamentalism. Like some people may be familiar with Jack Chick and his tracks. These are are comics that portray the Catholic Church again as this huge Illuminati international conspiracy with lots of really wacky charges like Catholicism made up Islam or Catholicism made up the Masons or Catholicism made up Marxism or, or all, basically if it's bad, the Pope made it up. And, and or that the Je- it's Jesuits again, that the Jesuits are out doing all of these all of these crazy things. Well, well, a frequent thing in those chick tracks and mm-hmm. in that, that fundamentalist American you know, propaganda against the church, one of the things that comes up over and over again is satanic worship, yes. right? You'll see in all these little cartoons, the church is worshiping Mary, who's a, a goddess. And then behind all of that, there's Satan. And one of the things that 
they frequently bring up is that the Pope is the Antichrist. Yes, which is, and, yeah. So the Catholic Pope is the Antichrist who leads people astray. And Mary is this kind of pagan goddess and that all of the chanting and incense and candles Right, which looks so different than American fundamentalists, right. where you're in some kind of stark wooden room and you're whatever reading the Bible, and then now you got all this weird exotic candles and incense and robes and all that stuff. Look, it looks exactly right. like some kind of weird what we imagine a weird satanic. Right. And so people begin to equate American fundamentalists equate in their imagination all of the candles and all. Because the other questions you ask is, where did you ever see a satanic worship service mm-hmm. to know what it looks like? Right. What's what we imagine it would look like, and what we imagine it would look is a Catholic mass. Yeah. And well, and, and it's equally antithetical to the more liberal or progressive strains of Christianity or of of non-believers because it just looks like superstition. They may not believe that it's that it's satanic or that there is a Satan, but it's it's still candles and robes and prayers and all of this kind of thing. It, it can't possibly be. They must be up to no good. And then right around the turn of the century, I'll I'll ask you to talk a bit more about this because you've actually read Dan Brown novels and I have not read them, but I was a teenager (laughs) when this all went down early in the century. And it was a, a huge thing. What? Angels and Demons and The Da Vinci Code are the two ones. And there was a movie of The Da Vinci Code. And from my Protestant Lutheran upbringing, I remember even. Protestant apologists having to whack on this stuff because it was all the Jesus was married and had descendants stuff, which Protestants also don't believe. But yeah, there was a huge, big, the Vatican is up to no good thing around that. Yeah. So as you say, th- there was an American kind of pulp fiction. I'm just going to call him that as a pulp fiction I think that's writer. an entirely fair label. Named Dan Brown. I don't know if he's still around. He used to write stuff, maybe. But he wrote, this, his big breakout book was something called The Da Vinci Code. Mm-hmm. And it was this just wacky, crazy pulp fiction. I mean, I had to admire the guy for just his imagination. Mm -hmm. But the basic premise of it is that Leonardo da Vinci, in all of his works and his paintings and his, those cool drawings he did of catapults and flying machines and all that, and in his writings, that he buried in all of his stuff this co- these coded messages now why he did that i don't know but for some reason he decided to bury in all of these coded messages and that there there that if you understand the symbology and he has this character that he has the main character of his novels who's like a harvard expert in symbolism or <laughs> symbology or something stupid and this guy is able to parse out all of these Mm -hmm. hidden codes and what they're all lead you to if you follow the crazy trail is that Jesus was married and he had this wife and his wife was really the first pope and they had a kid and all of this stuff was suppressed by certain followers who became the Catholic Church. But Jesus and it was Mary Magdalene was his wife. The Jesus married Mary Magdalene was his wife, and they had some kid, and then that kid like there's has heirs, and so there's like somewhere running around in the world the true heir to Jesus, and Leonardo da Vinci knew about all this somehow and was kind of in on the conspiracy, aware of the conspiracy, and somehow hid all these coded messages, and so the whole novel is this crazy thing where. You're trying to, you're, they're running around the Vatican and running around Roman Catholic churches and looking at all this stuff to try to piece all this stuff together and discover the mm-hmm. secret heir of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. It's just absolutely what, but okay. Mm-hmm. So it, I remember reading it because one time I was on a trip somewhere when it was like, it, when the, it was in the airport bookshop. Yeah, yeah. And so this paperback, so I read it on an airplane. It was like, this is some wacky stuff. And, but of course, it's publishing, and so it sold a gazillion copies, and so they said, we need to make a movie. Mm-hmm. And so they made a movie with Tom Hanks as the uh, symbologist guy, who, and they ran around Rome mm-hmm. trying to follow all this crazy stuff back. And it was when I was working for the largest uh, Protestant publisher, Christian publisher in the world, Zondervan Christian Publishing. and. So we knew the movie was coming out 
And I was part of a project at Zondervan where we called up a well-known Christian author at the time, Lee Strobel, still a well-known yeah, Christian yeah. author. And so we called up Lee, who was one of our authors, and said, hey, Lee, you've got a great idea. Let's put together a book debunking the Da Vinci Code. Now, this is Protestants even, just yeah, debunking yeah. how crazy this was. And so Lee was all- That's bad when- <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, Lee was cool. He yeah. was really into it, and and because he wrote Case for Christ and all this stuff. And so he's, oh, yeah, we should do it. So we had like 90 days before, or 100 days or something before the Hollywood movie with Tom Hanks was going to come out. Mm-hmm. And, and Lee like bangs out this 200 page book debunking all the Da Vinci code. And, and then I was in charge of putting it together with him and promoting it. And we went to this national book convention or whatever, and had Lee speak there and put it all out. We kind of capitalized on that, but fast forward a number of years later, I become Catholic and I'm leading a pilgrimage to Rome. My first pilgrimage that I led there with a group and there were people in the group who were like, they had read the Da Vinci Code and everywhere we went in Rome and the Vatican and other, the other big churches, they were like, where's that thing that was in the book? And I'm like, it isn't there. It's <laughs> not true. It we made it all up. <laughs> but it plays into this, as you mm-hmm. said, to kind of wrap this kind of, the Catholic Church has always been subject to these kinds of wacky, slanderous conspiracy theories. Yeah, and that one's very much within the the tradition, as you you said earlier, of it. It's the Vatican is it's the lying, keeping secrets. What I, I think that it's Opus Day in 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 that yeah, yeah. instead of the Jesuits, like Opus Day is assassinating people, right. and doing getting up to all kinds of crimes, and yeah, it, it's a creative new spin on it, but it's very much the same kind of material. So let me ask you this, the episode's getting a little long, but let's wrap it this. Why is it that you think that the Catholic Church for the last 2,000 years, from the Romans to Dan Brown, Mm. what is it about the Catholic Church that makes it such a great target for these kinds of wacky conspiracy theories, this kind of, you know, slanders of exotic corruption? Mm -hmm. There's something like, why is it such an... Why is it such a frequent target or an easy target for those kinds of conspiracies? I mean, part of it, is, as we said before, is just that it's the organized opposition to a number of the hallmarks of modernity, Protestantism, the Enlightenment, various governments. And so if they need a villain in the story, the church is the villain. It, it makes sense. Part of that is because the church is so old and established. Every, every villain has a backstory. And, and because the church is international, you can point to it and say, look, they're, they're operating all over the world and we don't like them. We don't, we don't agree with them. And therefore they must be doing all, all these kinds of bad things. And then I think there are some things that are just inherent to Catholicism. You mentioned the aesthetic things, robes or candles or, or chanting or, or any number of things, which, which are, appear foreign to, to modern people and feed into that perception of skullduggery, of medievalism and, and various things that modern people tend to, to look askance at. And also, I, I think just the fact that the, the church is in, in some meaningful sense always st- going to be standing in opposition to, to certain things in any age, that it, that it is going to be countercultural and, and spiritually it is going to be working against some things. I mean, it's going to be opposing errors of whether they be secular or Christians who are in schism from the church. And so if you're already against the church for those reasons, isn't, it's not that big of a leap in some cases to any stick is good enough to hit your opponent with. Yeah, I agree with everything you say. And I, I guess I would just see that and raise you that because it is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and so all of the biblical prophecies, mm-hmm. Old Testament, and the biblical prophecies or warnings about the age to come in the New Testament, that the church will be hated. Jesus said, people will hate you on account of me. The church will be persecuted. The church mm-hmm. will be scandalized. Yeah, I mean, we, right. we certainly shouldn't, behind all of this is the spiritual warfare component. Right, I mean, the spiritual Satan, warfare. Satan hates the church. Satan hates the church. Satan hates the church. And, and of course— all Christianity, but because the Catholic Church is, I believe, that's why we're doing this podcast, why we do this podcast, why we're Catholics, we believe that it is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. It is the sum of all churches. Mm-hmm. And so it, it is the target of Satan. And Satan is a liar. Not 
right? Jesus yep. said Satan is a liar, was a liar from the beginning yep. and always He's has He's a father been. of lies. The father of lies. And that's what he does. He lies about the church. He slanders the saints. The whole Bible is full of that. The whole Bible, Jesus promises that we're going to, promises the persecution of the church, promises the slander of the church, right? You know, even Paul says there's a time when people will find t- teachers to suit their itching ears. Peter talks about how People will turn aside from the truth to myths. All of these things are going to, this, that's just the nature of it. And so why is so much of it directed at the Catholic Church? More than any other church, because I think it's the one true church. Mm-hmm. And it, or it's the sum of all churches. It's the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So all of that satanic warfare, all of that opposition, all of the things that the Bible prophesies about from the fall in Genesis to the end, it all lands at and upon the Catholic Church. Yeah. And, and so that's one of the reasons I wanted to be Catholic. Because when I look around, I go, who, who's the one place that everybody slanders, everybody attacks, everything has always been attacked, that Satan attacks. What is the thing that Satan hates more than anything else? The Catholic Church. I remember on my road to Rome, that became more and more clear to me. After a while, all of the slander and conspiracy theories and propaganda against the Catholic Church at a certain point on my own journey, I actually kind of turned it around the other way. Like the more I felt like the world piled on the church, the more I wanted to be a part of it Mm -hmm. because it just seemed like the world and the enemy is always dogpiling on the Catholic church. So it must be the place that the truth is. Yeah. But before we're done, I think it might be good to, to get back to where we started, which is someone like the listener who was having the conversation with her father who brings up, I, and I don't know whether this listener's father brought up the Dan Brown stuff or, or any particular thing, but people do believe and buy into a lot of these slanders. And I think what we have to start with is just being patient with people and not pushing it too hard to begin with because they've bought into a whole narrative. And each specific instance just fits into the broader picture and there's confirmation bias it's very strongly operative there if you already believe generally that the catholic church is evil then you're much more likely to believe any particular thing if you're the product of the educational mm-hmm. system what were you taught in in schools what were you taught in our colleges if you've just been a good student you've been taught this you've been taught this from the beginning and a lot of it's implicit rather than explicit we say all the time in this podcast uh, and we've said this before you and i in episodes that look almost everything you think you know about the middle ages almost everything you think you know about the crusades almost everything that you think you know about the catholic church and history is wrong because it is you know it is the product of centuries and centuries of intentional, deliberate misinformation, disinformation, and slander. Mm -hmm. And so what does that person do? Uh, What what does she say to her father? Part of it is you have to start educating yourself about the truth. And we've done episodes here where we try to, we've broken down things about the Crusades and things about the Middle Ages and broken Mm -hmm. down things. And there's a lot of great resources. There's a lot of fantastic resources online. There's a lot of great books. Yeah, because that's what we didn't go into today is the actual historical or contemporary evidence against something like Dan Brown or the tunnels between the monasteries or the Inquisition or any of these number of things. But that scholarship is out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can find it really quickly and easily. And and that's something that we maybe should do some more episodes on. Maybe we need to do uh, some episodes on the 10 most frequent myths and slanders against the Catholic Church. And there are People have done good books about oh, that yeah. and good videos yeah. about that. Maybe that's something we should do in some upcoming episodes. But at least in, in the last conversation, we talked about sort of guard, what we called garden variety corruption, people stealing money and people doing naughty things, sexual things, and all these kinds of things. Not that those aren't terrible, but they're common to man. And then this one, this sort of exotic, mm-hmm. slanderous conspiracy theories about the Catholic Church. But yeah, we should definitely come back and maybe do, let's, let's work on that. So we, today we decided we need to do an episode, a book club episode, mm-hmm. or well, like a musical well, theater. I mean, music- I, I'm, I'm up for uh, trying to read nah, uh, maybe we should do a, if you want. But maybe like a musical maybe theater. Maybe sort of a edition. movie club thing. Yeah, maybe we need club, to get Ed Yeah, on a movie too. club thing. Yeah. We do Les Mis, uh, but also maybe we need to plan some episodes where we, we take on the, the 10 most common slanders about the Catholic church or something. Mm So well, we've got our work cut out ahead of us. All right. Hey, thanks for listening and please rate and review the podcast. As always, would you go to the website and 
please leave us a message, tell us a story, consider supporting the podcast financially. And you can always write me an email at consideringcatholicism at gmail.com. But Corey, thanks once again. You're welcome. Thank you. We'll be back soon. Sounds like we've got some episodes to prep. Yes, plenty. Okay, thanks. Thank you.